All right, the first time was just a test. This is <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome. It's so good to see everybody today. Um, as we prepare our spirits for worship, taking these words from Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. Come to me, all of you who are tired and carrying burdens, and I will give you rest. Now here are some announcements for our lives together. Our Halloween bash is tomorrow at 6 p.m. So we're, get your costumes and come on out. It's for the kids and kid at heart. So come get some candy. Come watch It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Um, come see Patrick in a hot dog costume. Um, the Great Pumpkin might make an appearance. You never know. Um, Fairy Hands is this Friday, November 4th at 6 p.m. It will be at the home of uh, Oh, yeah. um, and the details for that are in the bulletin um, here for the address. Um, it is a BYOB and BYO chair event, but dinner will be provided. Apple Butter Sunday is November 6th, and it's going to be at Lane and David's home. Um, their apple butter making process is from 10 to 3, and service is going to be at 11 a.m. like usual. Um, please sign up for a time to have your turn stirring the pot. This is also a BYO chair event. Um, there's a sign-up sheet that is I will that we are going to pass around. Um, so if you haven't gotten an opportunity to sign up for a time to stir the pot, please do. Teamwork makes the dream work. And you get to take a jar of apple butter with you. We'll get better. There's a session meeting today at 12.30. It will be hybrid, and Patrick is going to send out the link for folks attending on Zoom. Uh, now, if you will rise in body or spirit as we do. Oh, God, sometimes we feel beloved, and sometimes we feel broken. Comfort us, inspire us, and us. Your loving spirit breaks through the cracks in us and in our world. And your grace is with us when we're breaking down. Your strength is with us when we seek to break cycles of injustice. And your holy imagination is with us when we break tradition. Your welcoming arms embrace us when we come to your table to break bread. And your courage is with us when we're called to break the silence. May we be guided by your light to find peace in the pieces. Amen. Amen. All right. And our opening hymn this morning, if you'll stay standing or risen in spirit, is uh, hymn number 69, Here I Am, Lord.
So our Flourish language should be in your bulletin. It is language that describes who we are as a community. Please read it with me. We're Flourish, alone and together. We practice wholehearted life alone and together. Evergreen is an open and burning faith community. We live in the way of Jesus. We grow through spiritual practices that nourish the individual and cultivate a more compassionate and as we celebrate the gift of community today, um, we are going to share Christ's peace with, peace with one another. Um, please remember, COVID's not over as much as we all wish it was. Um, I always ask people, are you a handshake, high five, hug, or bow kind of person? And um, that kind of gives you an option for all of them. So, peace be with you, everybody. in there, uh, so please just be careful. Um, it's dots in there as well, uh, but just grab you a little snack. And while we're doing that, um, what, Beatrix, what's your most scariest Halloween moment? Uh, probably going to a haunted house with my youth group in church growing up. Oh, was it, was it in Memphis? No. Okay. In New York. What about CK? <laughs> she looked like the exact same. Yeah. yeah. Specifically being chased out of the haunted house by someone with a chainsaw. With a It's always a chainsaw at the end. It's literally always a chainsaw. Oh, uh, one more. Jeff, what's your scariest Halloween moment? Um, I think it's probably going to a haunted house with my youth group in church growing up. 
I was going to do Patrick, but, you know. Uh, well, um, there was one time on Halloween, there was a group of us who decided, uh, uh, this is not my decision, but I participated in this decision here. Um, there was, um, we rolled a house, you know, we... Oh, I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> Tissue a house. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and some of us, you know, that that were the smaller kids that you know that were not really able to run very fast, we decided to hide from the homeowners instead. Did y'all get caught? Did y'all get caught? Did y'all get caught? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was on. It was on. Catherine, it doesn't. Well, we actually remember we talked about uh, tissue on the house. We were just, she was like, I've never done that. And I was like, oh, it's I not too late. <laughs> so, guys, Catherine, we might be tissue on the house. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> I know all the strategies. <laughs> but happy Halloween, guys, and happy Sunday. So, with this, with the um, sheet that you have, it's Halloween Thinko. Um, and so, the candy, you can go ahead and open your candy, get your pieces out because you're going to use those pieces for bingo. Do not eat those pieces yet, guys. Okay. <laughs> Is everybody ready? Yeah. All right, guys. Go ahead and put one on your free spot. Put one on your free spot. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> right. Now, I believe you're supposed to get five in a row. Okay, the first person who gets five in a row, you get another fruit snack. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Actually, no. Actually, I'll make it interesting. You get to choose a game for the Memphis Hustle this year that you can go to. Cool. All right. All right, first one. Now, they didn't give me a guy. They just gave me pictures, okay? So I have to guess what, what these things are. So, Black Cat. <laughs> Frankenstein. And bless you, by the way. Pumpkin. R.I.P. Sparta Will. A bat. <laughs> Y'all are so cute. <laughs> Y'all have enough fruit snacks? Um, candy corn. Who likes candy corn? Raise your hands. Yo, y'all are disgusted. Y'all are disgusted. <laughs> um, the little purple thing, the, the purple thing that looks scary. What is that? Baby Grimace. Baby Grimace. Teach me. <laughs> the dead skull. Yeah, the crossbow. <laughs> The oozing pot of green stuff. I see people using their fingers. Yeah. <laughs> I can get you more. We got more fruit sex somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody has bingo yet. That's crazy. I'm one away. Me too. Oh, let's see. The witch. I think it was a witch on there. Okay. Yes. Oh, the one on the broomstick. Yes. Bingo. All right. Let's see what you have now. Okay. She has. She has the black cat. No, that wasn't on You're supposed to be the partner. You're not going to the hustle game. <laughs> All right, she has the purple minutes, the grimace, the minutes. What's his name? <laughs> grimace, the minutes. Okay. <laughs> and we have the candy corn, and we have Frankenstein. You guys clap it up for Miss Ruth. Yeah. So I'll put your you get to choose, make sure you contact me, okay? Y'all have a good week. Thank y'all so much. Eat your snacks and leave your papers out. Get those later. Happy Halloween. Thank <laughs> you.
Sorry, I took your kid's name. Sorry, I think this will be the first time I've read scripture and digging fruit snacks out of my teeth. Really? I'm sorry. Could be a caramel apple. Could be. Before we go to this reading from the book of Nehemiah, I want to say a few words. I guess it's a bit of a disclaimer about this book. Um, it's one of my favorite books, but it's also had, it also has some very, very troubling passages. And um, the thing about Evergreen is y'all are the kind of folks who are, I just feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of questioners in this church, which I really like. And there's a lot of folks. I'm just stretching. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if you try to read the scripture, but then someone opens up their Bible and they're reading, and then like the very next passage is one that's really disturbing, but the pastor never addresses it. You know, I'm the kind of person, I think some of you are too, where you think, why wasn't that terrible thing brought up? So um, I just want to say a few words on some of the elements of the book of Nehemiah and also the book of Ezra. Uh, so for, for a little bit of context, uh, for the longest time, there was the book of Ezra and the second book of Ezra, which was Nehemiah. Um, these are two characters, and if you look at both those books, Ezra's the first one, Nehemiah's the second one, and um, they tell the same story but from two different perspectives. So this is a time where um, the Israelites have been in the Babylonian exile. Babylonians came in, they conquered, uh, conquered them, they destroyed Jerusalem, they take people out for anywhere at least 40 years, maybe up to about 60, 80 years, if they are in exile and away from their home. The Persians defeat the Babylonians. And now the Israelites are allowed by the Persians to come back to Jerusalem. So the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah is, uh, is Ezra talking about the rebuilding of the spiritual lives and the kind of the emotional and the health and just the, the morale of the community. And Nehemiah is the actual physical rebuilding. Nehemiah is heading up, uh, fixing all the broken buildings and the homes and the walls of Jerusalem. So you have two characters, Ezra, that's kind of focused on what's going on in people's hearts and the feel of the community. Nehemiah is literally focused on rebuilding of the buildings. Uh, and these two characters are trying to work together to govern these folks and help them put back the pieces after their time in the Babylonian exile. Um, and there will be some, uh, I'll give you a little deep, deeper disclaimer on some of the troubling parts between uh, Ezra and Nehemiah after this reading from the second chapter of Nehemiah, verses 17 and 18. Uh, but before we go to that, let's pray. Spirit of the living God, help us to hear what your word is revealing to us today. Help us to find the wisdom and the beauty and the power, even in books that don't just inspire, but can also trouble us. Amen. This is Nehemiah uh, speaking as he writes, uh, he writes this book, kind of as his own narrative. Then I, Nehemiah, said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. I told them that the hand of my God had been gracious upon me and also the words that the king of Persia had spoken to me. And they said, Let's start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. So, Nehemiah and Ezra. Um, as I said, they are coming back from at least 40 years in Babylonian exile. Many of these folks haven't even seen Jerusalem or the whole province of Judah. Many of them, if they had, they were small children at best. So when they come back, they are interpreting the Torah, the laws uh, given by Moses. And Torah literally means the law. And some of their interpretations are not what we would say just or compassionate or kind. The big thing that Ezra and Nehemiah preach to folks toward the end of each of their books is the community is trying to learn how to be community. 
and uh, decide on how they're going to do life together after their community is rebuilt is that they will not uh, marry people or have family with people that are not Israelites. And what, how that has been often interpreted is when Ezra preaches this, and in the book of Ezra, we get the first, um, really the first uh, description of a worship service in, in scripture. When they come back and they, they finally rebuilt everything, they built Jerusalem and the community feels like they're in a good spot. They'll have this worship service that celebrates and, uh, and commits the temple um, to God. One of the things that Ezra says is, interprets the law and says, you know, you can't be with people that aren't Israelites and, and people cry and they weep. And folks, um, a lot of people have interpreted that as uh, it is their sinfulness and their, uh, their guilt that causes all the folks to weep. But uh, there's a professor at Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo, Egypt, and Dr. Corey Driver, who has a great commentary on a site called Working Preacher, which is a, a commentary from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, he had just a great way of talking about this. He said, maybe it is, maybe it is the case when Ezra and Nehemiah, two of the leaders in this community, when they say you shouldn't be with people that aren't Israelites, maybe, maybe those folks do cry because they feel guilty for their sins. But he said, I, I think there's something more real and more honest going on. He said, I think we are seeing people cry because of spiritual abuse. I think we are seeing people cry because they are having to divorce and even get rid of their children and send them away from the community because they are not full Israelites. And it feels more obvious that this is spiritual abuse done by the leaders. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah are human. And I think this is uh, one of those elements in scripture, uh, one of those examples in scripture of a bad example. I think scripture gives us a lot of good examples and I think scripture gives us a lot of bad examples. Now, Jesus interprets some of these same laws from Moses, and Jesus interprets them in a very different way than Ezra and Nehemiah did. So while we look at uh, the narrative of Nehemiah and some of what I think is some of the most um, beautiful descriptions of discerning a call and a vision, I also want to make it very clear that Nehemiah and Ezra were full of flaws. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that these are both men in power who are motivated <clears throat> by fear of the community, uh, being uh, in trouble and falling apart again and going into exile and out of that fear, they, uh, they hurt a lot of people and cause a lot of damage to communities. And I think that's pretty real of the church and religious institutions today, right? I think we see a lot of folks who out of their fear cause a lot of harm. So um, as, we, as we go to scripture, it's important to note that there are some scripture that's prescriptive and some scripture that's descriptive. Some is prescribing how we should behave and how we should act, and some is describing how people behaved and acted, and we should not do that, <laughs> right? And sometimes it takes, you got to keep reading sometimes. Sometimes it looks like it ends and puts a bow on it, but the heart of scripture keeps going, and you realize, oh, that one book isn't all of scripture. There's more there that shows me that actually this is not the path to go down. And we discern what is prescriptive and what is descriptive by being in community by being guided by the Holy Spirit and being guided most of all by love. So here we have Nehemiah, someone who was motivated by the trauma of exile and the fear of exile happening again. And he wants to do right by these people. He is a high ranking official with the Persian empire. He has a good relationship with the king and he is Jewish. So he wants what's best for Jerusalem and the Jewish people. And he wants them to flourish and thrive after years of being oppressed and in the pain of exile. So he becomes the governor of Judah, Judah being the whole province, Jerusalem being the capital of that province. And of course, he goes through all the ins and outs uh, after he uh, uh, gets to Jerusalem, all the, all the, parties and all the celebrations and he sees and he notices he's heard about it but he sees for the first time how much disrepair the city is actually in that it was destroyed by war and then nothing was ever done with it and it just was left for decades upon decades so he sees that homes and the temple and the walls that protect jerusalem are all crumbling so he decides something must be done 
if people are going to have homes and if we're going to have a temple, if we're going to have an actual society again, we got to rebuild all this. So he has to get all the correct permission. If you like a narrative with lots of red tape bureaucracy, Nehemiah is a great book for you. <laughs> he assembles his workers. He gets people on board with the project. He fills out all the right paperwork. But then, but then there's some obstacles. Some external ones and some internal ones. The external ones come first. There's groups that are attacking those in Jerusalem as they're trying to rebuild. So then there's setback after setback, and there's more grief, and there's more grief because they're trying to protect each other while also still trying to rebuild everything that's going on. So he has to deal with the external threats to his work. And then there's the internal obstacles. Nehemiah notices that the Jewish nobles are oppressing those who are poor. So Nehemiah institutes the cancellation of all debt. And while previous governors had been corrupt and oppressive, and joined with the Jewish nobles in getting money and overtaxing these folks that are already marginalized. Nehemiah is now seen as a governor who is finally righteous and who is just and wants equity within the community. Now, when he set out to do this building project, it wasn't supposed to take that long. It's just rebuilding a few walls, a temple, some homes. Right? Everyone got on board. There's a lot of excitement. We've all seen this, right? We all read the paper about some new building thing, or you are part of a group that's uh, building something new, or maybe you're building a new home, and you think, yeah, it's not going to take that long. <laughs> it takes a little over 12 years for them to rebuild Jerusalem, mostly due to the setbacks, outside threats, the inside threats. You know that that kind of project, when you're trying to keep people united, you're trying to keep people living in equity and injustice, and then you're also trying to keep people safe from groups that see a great opportunity to come in and hurt you and take your land and your, and your resources. You can imagine that there's every kind of emotion for these folks and every kind of emotion for me and mine. Breaking ground on a new project is not easy. But it's funny because as I was thinking about this uh, this title, breaking ground, and obviously if you haven't figured out our little our little shtick throughout this whole series is breaking, and then we fill in the blank, and that's a lot of fun as a staff to get creative on how many things can break and make a title out of it. <laughs> and I was thinking about breaking ground, and I was thinking about the way that that Nehemiah discerns and figures out a vision and works with people to build something new. I got thinking about uh, a moment in my first position as a pastor of a church up in Ohio, and uh, I was involved, small town, new, most of the pastors have been there for decades, I get to town, and, and you know, it's this whole, let's put them on this board, let's put them on that, I'm not qualified to do any of this, but I found myself getting on a lot of boards and, and being in a lot of, like, local paper, paper uh, photographs and all this, because I was, you know, the pastor, and um, I've been there a little over a year, and I got to go to a groundbreaking ceremony. I was asked to go be one of the people that has a shovel and a hard hat, even though, like, I showed up, and they handed me a shovel. I was like, this makes sense. Like, I, I don't know what we're doing. I'm not qualified to be here, but fine, I'll hold the shovel. We're breaking ground. Then they handed me a hard hat, and I looked around, and it's just a field. If you've been to Northwest Ohio, it's just land. And I was like, do I, I don't know if I need the hard hat. And they were like, no, and you have to put it on. And then I realized that one of the other pastors uh, in the community that had quote said that my sermons were adored as Satan. Uh, I saw that he had a shovel in his hands. So yeah, give me that hard hat. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so these things are celebrated, and it's the photo op, and everyone you know takes a little pile of dirt. And it's always the people that aren't actually built dig once and never dig again, right? Because and that hard hat's not getting any action. So um, that's what we like to do. We like to celebrate, like yay, groundbreaking. And then no one pay attention for a while, and then suddenly it's built. But if you've gone through any rebuilding, if you've gone through any groundbreaking in your own life, any season of putting the pieces back together, you know it's not just a celebration at the beginning. And then a nice little peaceful season of building, and then boom, some sort of commitment ceremony where you can celebrate that all the work is done. You've probably gone through a season of rebuilding in your personal life. Maybe you renovated your home 
Maybe you uh, had to fix a toilet that wanted to flush upward instead of downward. <laughs> Maybe you had to find a new apartment because you couldn't afford the one you're in anymore. Maybe you had to move out of a house after divorce. Maybe you had to find a new job after suddenly being laid off and worried you can't afford the place you're in. Maybe you had to downsize your place because you shared that home with someone and that someone has died and that empty house is just too much. You want to heat up some meatballs, Randy? Sometimes a season of rebuilding and a season of groundbreaking oh, is exciting and sometimes it's heartbreaking and sometimes it's all the above and everything in between. Sometimes the work of rebuilding piece out of the pieces when life falls apart can feel like it's just you and a shovel and you're just digging and digging and digging and you don't feel like you're making any progress. But in these seasons of rebuilding, we got to start somewhere. For Nehemiah, he saw a need. The pain of people he loved. I mean, do you think? He saw the disrepair, he saw the destruction of the homes and the walls in the city. So he talked with people and he prayed, he discerned what could be next, what could be possible. And he found a vision. And he made plans for how that vision was going to get carried out. One of the things I love about this book is that the vision never changes. There's a vision of a city and of a society that can be beautiful and equitable. Obviously not perfect. Ezra and Nehemiah were certainly not perfect, but there was a vision of how they could take a step and how they could thrive. And the plans didn't have to change here and there, but the vision always stayed the same. There were obstacles, there were setbacks, there were frustrations, but the vision didn't change. Yeah, so we have that. Yeah. I've been yeah. thinking about this a lot, um, really over the past couple of weeks. No, I think right. I'll just put um, Parmesan on it after. I, was, I got to be away I got to be out, uh, for some vacation mm -hmm. time doing some national parks out west, which was incredible, and we had a lovely time. And then, um, I was with my uh, clergy cohort, a group of us that have been together since 2015 that all started ministry at the same time, we're all over the country. And that time, to be frank, was not, uh, was not what I wanted it to be. I think, we're, I think I'm in a different place than a lot of my, my colleagues are. But um, having that intentional time to talk about what ministry looks like, and even Sikana, we, a week ago, we went to worship at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, it was just, it was so good for the soul to be good. in that congregation. It was a congregation very similar to ours in a lot of ways. They're in a, they're in a not a, a newly renovated space, they're in a very historic space, a space that looks very Santa Fe, um, was a Spanish-speaking uh, church for a very long time, and they still had some of that. Um, there was still Spanish. The worship, um, there's also a Korean community that, that worships there on Sunday nights. Small membership congregation, aging congregation. Their pastor, uh, Pastor Matt, um, just graduated seminary in 2020. So we talked about what that is like starting at a church in 2020. And I, I told her, we were, it was just the three of us chatting after worship. And I said, I don't know about you, but when I started, I felt more incompetent than I'd ever felt in my life. I felt like, because you know, if y'all know me, technology is not my thing. Sure. Yeah. And you know that. That's true. Can't save my tail. <laughs> um, technology is not my thing, and uh, I had to learn. I had to learn a lot. Um, I think we all do, right? I mean, lockdown happens, and whether it's just in our own personal lives or in our own uh, professional lives, if we're still in a place we're working or, or choose to work, then man, we, I think. All of society is like, how do, how do we how do we make sense of this? And and I recognize as you can, we're incredibly fortunate that we got to keep keep our jobs because a lot of folks did. And I'm gonna put this in a smaller bowl. Before. Maybe you'll take it tomorrow. The early days of lockdown. And, and I, as I was talking to you Pastor to Madeline at Westminster and talking to my cohort, this is the first time we had all gathered together since lockdown happened. 
um, we're all kind of sharing like how we how on earth we tried to like figure it out and how so many folks in our congregation stepped up to help us and and, uh, and support us and, and how congregations try to support each other especially for folks that had the incredible financial stress or heaven forbid they lost someone to COVID how on earth we tried to hold each other and care for each other and it felt like since since I started at Evergreen that's been so much of my ministry um, is figuring out how to respond to COVID. And and because that's what we have to do, and then I kind of realized on this trip, like it's not going anywhere, and it's still it's still part of it, but can it can just be part of it. It doesn't have to be the defining piece of my time at Evergreen, which I hope is a long time. And I started thinking, how do we discern a vision for what's next? How do we, as a community of faith, as we um, have had some transitions with staff, as we've had uh, all all the transition and all the the pain and the and the frustrations and the sadness and the just the anger that comes with COVID and the local and national elections and as we try to do work for justice and compassion in our community and also recognize man like we're a small church we got big hearts and we got big coalitions going but how do we, how do we be the most effective we can be as we're asking all these questions and I see so much goodness and passion and faithfulness in this community I start thinking how can we discern a vision forward. And even when the plan, the plans change, and even when there's obstacles, that vision doesn't change. That we can still keep moving. That we can still build on this excitement and the beauty and the fun that we have here at Evergreen to continue to be the church that we are, and that we know we can continue to be. It's what an opportunity! It's so exciting. I I I spent some time. Um, Couple extra days in Albuquerque after my cohort met, and I was talking with some colleagues there about Guns to Gardens, a Guns to Gardens program in New Mexico. It was one of the first. And I would take some time to often um, just kind of walk through parts of Albuquerque because it was beautiful, the weather was great, and I didn't want to rent a car. <laughs> and I would just think about this congregation, all the things on the horizon. I mean, all the fun that we have as a church. For the visitors that we've had and these new friendships that are coming about that are being built for seeing the connections made at, at our small group for some of these connections and hearing these stories from some of you that have been in this community for decades. I think about the, the church's commitment to Micah and to you, Kirk, and the Pine Press and potential work with, with Just City. And I think about deepening our witness with pride and efforts for a more beautiful world and more embracing theology. I mean, man, the sky is the limit. It is incredibly, incredibly beautiful and exciting. So yeah, we may be a smaller church in terms of membership and in a smaller building than most churches, but there's a big heart and there's big faithfulness. And I am so excited for what's on our horizon. So as we move through the fall and into Advent, into Christmas and a new year, I am so excited for this congregation to discern what God's calling this community to do and for us to find a vision together. Breaking ground is hard work, but Evergreen's done it over and over and over. There's two buildings still standing that show the times we've broken ground, and now we're in this beautiful, incredible spot, and we didn't have to break ground, but man, some of the renovations, some of the art that's here, the testament you can read in, in the pamphlets on that spec table or on that beautiful, shiny piece of metal, this church has always found ways to be creative and move forward and embrace its calling for the next steps of its life. So yeah, breaking ground is hard work. And putting pieces together to find peace is hard work. But, but when we have each other, when we're, when we're guided by the Holy Spirit, each inch of dirt that we dig up is worth it. In the name of the triumph God of faith, hope, and love. Amen. <laughs> Friends, my name is Beatrix Swallow. I'm the parish associate here at Evergreen and chaplain of Rhodes College. And part of our tradition is that we spend time both alone and together in silence. So as we uh, reflect on the good word proclaimed to us this morning, I invite you to reflect on 
uh, breaking ground and finding peace in the pieces. Friends, uh, the church, uh, many, many traditions and arms of the church celebrates All Saints on November 1st. So sometimes there's All Saints worship or some sort of All Saints service on that day on November 1st. Sometimes it happens before or after. So uh, we're going to take some time today to celebrate our saints. Uh, in the Presbyterian tradition, we do not, um, we do have saints, and that is, we're, I want to say who you're looking at, but you're all looking at me, so, but look at each other, <laughs> those are your saints. We recognize that uh, we are sinner and saint 100% of both, 100% of the time, and that we, um, there's a great witness, a great cloud of witnesses of saints that have gone before us. And often what is done on these All Saints service is that we remember those who we've lost in the past year. Um, but I feel like at this community, we don't have to just contain it in 365 days. I feel like if there are saints in your life or saints of this church um, that you lost years and years ago, grief doesn't stop after 365 days. Grief keeps coming back um, and we can't predict it. So this is a time for us to honor those saints and to thank them for what they've taught us. One of my uh, mentors growing up called it our lanterns of love, who are our lanterns of love that have guided us. So there's gonna be a couple ways that we can honor those saints today. Uh, the first one is this table uh, over here. Uh, I'm gonna light a candle and if you, if you happen to bring anything uh, to set there or any sort of token with you that reminds you of, a, of someone, uh, you're welcome to place it on that table. I have a a picture from my office of a saint named Wilbur. Uh, and there's also some post-its over there. You can put the post-it with a little note on it on whatever you brought, or you can just put the post-it straight on the table, whatever you'd like. And you're invited to do that while the choir is singing during our offertory. Um, and there'll also be some time when the choir finishes uh, for those who sing in the choir, uh, or the, for those who simply want to uh, take in what the choir is offering, then you're, there'll be some, some moments of silence to do that as well, as well there. And then as our offertory prayer, there'll be some times to say names aloud. Um, and I'll get to some instructions for that when we get there. And that'll be also a way for those on Zoom to participate um, with lifting up their saints. Um, so with that, you're invited to um, offer the names uh, or any of the tokens and prayers of gratitude for those uh, that you've loved and who have guided you. Patrick. <coughs> Patrick. It's part of the woo woo. I'm excited and proud of the choir <laughs> for um, uh, relaunching today. Um, and we're not always going to tell you uh, this. We're singing a, a song that you would find in your hymnal. Probably many of you know it very well. Um, but we talked a little bit about the history of this song, and it's so relevant to uh, all saints that I just wanted to quickly share while we assemble. Um, this song, When Peace Like a River is Well with My Soul, was written in 1876 by a Presbyterian minister named Horatio Spafford. And that's probably not something I um, probably should admit, but I, I probably wouldn't have cared about that as much, but um, we, as we were learning it, learned the story 
that he wrote this hymn. Uh, this minister was going on vacation with his wife and four daughters. They were going to Europe by boat. And he, at the last minute, was called behind to, to work. So he went ahead and sent his wife and children ahead of him, and they were in a shipwreck. And all four of his daughters were among the 276 individuals who were lost at sea. And his wife sent him the devastating telegram. She was one of a few survivors, and she sent him a telegram that just said, saved alone. So he immediately boarded a ship to cross the ocean and join her in Paris. And uh, midway across the Atlantic Ocean, just alone with his grief, um, he passed approximately the spot where the wreck happened and had the inspiration to write this song. Uh, so this is a hymn that is very much the story of faith born from grief, and uh, I thought that would be pertinent to share.
Friends, now is the time when we come together to multiply our Jesus. We forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 544. And we're going to sing this three times.